Oh, greetings, everybody. I'm Bart Massey. Uh, hopefully, this isn't too loud and distracting to the people in the back. Um, if you can't hear, move to the front. If you're, it's too loud, move to the back, and we'll all be happy. Um, here today to talk to you about Python as a programming language. I, I want to say some things about the talk itself before I dive into the talk. Uh, I uh, have been building programming languages, studying programming languages. I have an advanced degree in programming languages, et cetera, for a really long time now. And so the plan for the talk really is to give you some insight into what someone with that background and some software engineering background and stuff sees. Um, you know, I, I program fluently in a dozen different languages. And so I want, you, I, I want you to sort of get some feeling maybe for what someone like me sees when I jump into a language like Python. What, what kinds of things do I notice and what kind of things might be different? And I hope that's an interesting thing. I hope it'll be at least fun. Um, one of the things I really want to encourage from the very beginning is I'm always happier to have a conversation than a lecture. Lectures make everyone fall asleep and uh, conversations are great. So please, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and you know, offer a question or comment. And if during the presentation, and if I don't, you don't get my attention, please don't hesitate to yell. Um, and uh, as if it's, you know, I'll keep it moving. That's my job. Your job is to make it an experience we'll all enjoy, I hope. Um, so this keyboard, by the way, that's in this first slide is actually a real thing. I've distorted it a little bit, but it is for sale. If you need a keyboard that has Python keys on it, then that is actually a photo. Um, so, you know, hopefully that's something that you might have fun with too. Let's see. So, um, yeah, I've just, I've decided to do something a little different just for grins today. I, I've been, you know, following sort of Reddit's Our Advice Animals group and you know, watching all these meme photos go by for years. And I thought maybe that would be a fun thing to provide some interest for the talk. This is Insanity Wolf. I'll try to introduce these people for the folks who don't know them as they come along. Um, and uh, maybe the little baby Insanity Wolf would have been a better choice for this. But uh, you know, so that's, that's, that's sort of what those things are doing. Hopefully it'll give you some context for what I'm thinking as I put these slides up. So, you know, and the reason I'm doing that is really just you know, let's all stay awake um, and uh, let's, let's stay engaged. And please, you know, I'm not a Python guru. I mean, nobody would call me a mas an ultimate master of the Python programming language. So when I make some mistake or say something stupid, please forgive me and then please call me out on it. I'm good with that. Make sense? So are we good? Yay, let's have some fun and talk. Um, the, the, the Faramir here. Um, the, um, you know, analyzing a programming language is one of those things that, you know, there's a certain amount of stuff that you're looking at um, that you figure out as you go along what things are kind of important and what structure to look at. And this is the kind of things that I look at when I'm looking at a programming language. Um, I look at the, some language design things and some software engineering things, because really, one of the great tragedies in programming language development and software engineering in the last 20 or 30 years is that they've diverged a lot. Um, the people doing programming and the people doing languages don't talk to each other as much as they used to, and I think it's a complete disaster. One of the things I find is a real strength of Python is that it is motivated from both sides of the fence. It's motivated by people trying to produce software and understanding how it's engineered and motivated by people who have some idea and understanding of what a programming language design might look like from a programming language standpoint. So, you know, specific things that I think are super important in looking at is sort of, first of all, in language, you typically break it into two things. You break it into syntax. How do you spell stuff? You know, what kind of keywords do you have? What kinds of, you know, Syntax, do you have at the level of just what an, how you break things into keywords? And then higher level syntax, what's the grammar? What's the structure of the language? And all that's really interesting. It's really important. And if you read, you know, if you're a, reading stuff on the internet about programming languages, you find that 80% of the discussion is around that, which I think is really, really too bad because it generally isn't the most important piece. I, you know, as a programming languages person with you know, a bunch of experience, I don't get very excited anymore about which operator you use for what 
operation or how many characters the keyword long the keywords are or any of that stuff. Those kinds of things are important maybe, and I'll talk about some of them as we go on in regard to Python. But the really important thing is semantics, which is the level of what meaning do statements in the language have. And I'm always really curious when I'm looking at a language, you know, what are the semantics of that language? If I want to express some particular meaning in my program, you know, what do I say to make that happen? And that's really where the magic and the power and the traction is in using a programming language, is its way of describing meaning. Um, something that isn't on the slide, but probably should be, there'll be a lot of those. Uh, you know, there are two audiences, at least, for a computer program, right? There's the computer and there's the human beings who are reading and writing it. The second audience is the important audience. And so when I'm looking at semantics, I'm not even necessarily looking at execution semantics, because you know, computers are fine, they'll figure it out. I'm looking at, can I, as a human being, understand what this code's supposed to do? Can, have I, can I communicate what the code's supposed to do to other human beings? Make sense? Um, so that's, that's the first thing, is you know, I kind of look at it with that eye, yeah. Yeah, I'm not comfortable critiquing a language where I'm not reasonably fluent in its syntax and semantics at an intermediate level. And what that means is that when people ask me to critique languages like, uh, pick an example, Go. Um, you know, my initial experiences with Go have been what they've been, but I really don't feel like I know it well enough to, to say anything very intelligent about its semantics. And so, yeah, I think it's really important to get your head around it. Almost always, there again, I, you know, the slides are a starting point for a conversation. Let's try to have the conversation rather than be slaves to the slides. There's a uh, certain amount of different motivations for why languages get created. And sometimes the motivations for continuing development of a language are very different from the motivations of the initial creators. Certainly one motivation, which I think is a good motivation for creating a language, is that you have some, like you say, unusual, interesting idea about how to create meaning, you know, programs with meaning, that isn't well served by the syntax and semantics of existing programming languages. You know, a good example of that would be Prolog, which takes an approach to thinking about programming, which is completely different than approaches that preceded it. And yeah, you need a new language, because you need, it. it's really awkward to express the ideas Prolog captures in, any of the languages that had existed at the time it was created. In the modern world, um, uh, Corbin's Monty language, I don't know if Corbin's here somewhere. Um, Corbin needs to be here to heckle me because I heckled him yesterday. I don't see him though. Anyway, Corbin's Monty language that he's been talking about here, I think too, is definitely an example of that. On the other hand, sometimes the considerations are other more mundane things. And I think to some extent, Python wasn't built around let's have novel semantics, right? I don't, think that, I don't think there's a lot in the Python semantics, or really even frankly a ton in the Python syntax that's like, this is gonna change the world. There might be a couple of things, I'll try to identify them. It's more that we need a combination of nuanced features that accomplish a certain thing. You know, we're responding more to deficiencies, maybe in this, minor deficiencies in the syntax and semantics of existing languages than trying to break new ground. And that's legitimate too, it's a thing. Um, there are worse motivations. Um, when I was in the 80s, I was working with a person who designed perhaps the worst programming language ever commercially sold. Um, it, it was really a hideous monstrosity, and his motivations had nothing. No, 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 this made PHP look like Haskell. I mean, no, no. I mean, it was really, you've never heard of it. It ran only on the Apple Mac, and really only on the 68K Apple Mac, and uh, um, because, yeah, things. Anyway, um, and his motivations were entirely about making a name for himself, making, as a software person, even though he wasn't, making money. Um, you know, it was, and the result was maybe he achieved some of those things a little bit, but geez. Um, you know, Python is in a good place there. Um, and then there's the software engineering considerations, because you know, programming languages are ultimately useless unless you build programs with them. That's kind of a thing. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, so, you know, we're interested in how do we build software. There's some real things here. I, I look at modularity really early on um, because probably the most, the, another kind of language that maybe is less interesting than it could be is a language in which you can't build large programs. That may be really appropriate for certain kinds of domain-specific languages and stuff like that, but if, in general, if you're claiming to be a general-purpose programming language, but you can't build large programs well, then it doesn't really matter um, what your language is. Um, the second category, you know, other things that you worry about is, you know, how much does the language encourage defects in programs? Um, there's this classic IEEE terminology of error, fault, and failure. A human makes a mistake. The mistake leads to a defect. The de defect leads to a you know, failure of some kind in the software. We want to stop making defects that lead to failures. And to stop that at the root cause, we need to make sure humans don't make mistakes. Many programming languages have features. Every programming language has features that encourage humans to make mistakes. And sometimes you know, we've known what they are for a long time. Um, the, we want to get rid of them as much as we can. Um, and that goes hand in hand with ease of learning. Um, you know, you want a small, simple, easy to learn language. Haskell is one of my favorite languages. You'll hear me mention a lot in this talk. Its learning curve is devastatingly difficult. It took me many, many years to get to where I was even comfortable with the language, and I still don't feel like I've mastered it. Um, you know, that's a thing. Debuggability. Um, if I do make a mistake, and a defect is introduced into my program, and it does lead to a failure, can I find it? Can I fix it? I mentioned performance. It shouldn't have been really even that high in the list. Performance is one of the last things I think about. Um, my personal philosophy as a language person, and I think most of my colleagues as language people, you know, obviously you don't want to throw performance on the ground, but in most situations, most of the time, a computer's already a machine that's fantastic at producing wrong answers quickly. I don't need a wrong answers quickly producing machine. I'm plenty willing to wait until the right answer comes out. Yeah. Right, so the question is, you know, how important is simplici simplicity as an objective in language design? And I think it's a fantastic question. Different people would give different answers. You, you mentioned specifically C was mentioned as a la an example of a simple language with a lightweight syntax. Um, one of the interesting things that's happened in languages is an evolution over time in uh, complexity of languages. When C was introduced, everybody looked at it and said, oh my gosh, 20 operators and 11 levels of operator precedence, that's a crazy complicated language. How would I ever learn that? How would I ever handle it? You know, when I was talking to somebody today, when ADA first came out, it was almost considered impossible to build an ADA compiler. This language is so big and complicated, we can barely build tools for it. By 2015 standards, it looks like a pretty straightforward, simple language. Um, so we've had language size and complexity creep. And I think every programming language designer I know tries to push back against that, but language design is hard, and at the end of the day, it is about building programs, it is about software engineering. If I need things, I put in what I, the best thing I can figure out to get those things. There's an ideal here which is not easy to reach, which is to provide a small, simple collection of features that can be combined in arbitrary ways to get you know, arbitrarily cool, complicated behaviors. Again, languages like Haskell, languages like my own nickel programming language, which I'll talk about at some point with Keith Packard. Um, you know, try, you know, try really hard to achieve these goals. Um, a language like C++ obviously is much less concerned. Um, and on that scale, I would say Python is in a good place, um, you know, from the point of view of a language designer. They've managed to provide the ability to do a lot of fairly fancy software engineering without making the language so big and complicated. I don't know very many people who are like, oh, I can't learn Python competently. I can't use Python easily because it's just so big. I, it's not a thing. It's not a Python thing. Does that answer your question? Cool. Other stuff? We should get to our second slide. Sorry about this. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go as quick as we can. I, I'll try to manage, manage time. But I'd rather, I'd rather talk about, a, I have more slides than we can get to, honestly, even if we run a little over. So 
Um, I'd rather talk about a few things in depth, so as long as people are interested, we'll keep talking. Um, so, I mean, one of the things, speaking of C, thank you for the setup question, um, that Python did is borrow a lot of uh, syntax from C, uh, among other places, like Fry here is indicating. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some things about that that's cool, and there's some things about that that's not. One of the goals in our nickel programming language um, was to use the syntax and semantics of C as much as we could stand, and there are places where we couldn't stand it and we did something different. Python seemed to have a, a similar goal in its design, but with a lot different, with a little different threshold for how much they could stand, and that's fair, I think. Um, some of the, you know, there's some things that are obviously borrowed from C syntax. The whole equals, double equals thing, for example, is a thing that exists because C did that. I don't think there's any better justification. And, um, you know, a lot of the keywords are borrowed from C. Uh, it's clearly a C-inspired language. Um, some of the operators, et cetera. Um, the upside of that, of course, is if you're familiar with C or C-like languages, Java, C++, whatever, um, there's a certain comfort level there. Um, the downside of it is that, first of all, C operators aren't always a model of fine design choice. <laughs> and so, you know, you see that reflected in things like Python's uh, choice of and and or as keywords rather than operators. Um, I think this is arguably a good choice in that the double ampersand and double pipe of C are hard to read, hard to write. It's a, a barrier to beginners and really a barrier to normal people to actually read. But on the other hand, it means that as a C programmer, sometimes often C programmer, often Java programmer, I jump into a Python program and find, constantly find myself syntax erroring until I get back into that mode of typing and and or. Um, the other goal, clearly, besides adopting C syntax, was to try to have a pseudocode-like syntax. I mean, somebody commented earlier in one of the talks that, you know, Python's a, pseudo a pseudocodish syntax. And I agree, and I consider that a huge feature. Um, pseudocode, right, is the language of algorithms, textbooks. It's the language of newbie tutorials, and it should be a language. You know, it gets us away from syntax and surface semantics of a language and on to, into talking about what programs are like. The closer you can match it, yay. Haskell has a little different approach to being pseudocode-like. Um, and I think to the extent you can do that, it's great. And that's, you know, the, the, the offside rule, different block syntax, which we'll talk a little bit about later, is a good example of that. Um, leaving a lot of pieces of C out that make it hard to read, you know, that's something you notice right away if you're familiar with C. Oh, look, there's not any more postfix and prefix increment and decrement. Um, how many people really miss the postfix and prefix increment and decrement? A few. Wow, interesting. That's a few more than I would have thought. <laughs> I don't miss them at all because I think they were incredibly error prone um, and difficult to read. Uh, in Nickel, which does include them, I should be full disclosure, the programming language I helped design have them. We went to a lot of trouble to make their, sin their semantics well-defined and clear so that you would be less confused about them. I still think they're hard to read and I don't use them. I don't throw them around a lot in my nickel programs. Um, there's a problem that is referred to in UI design as the cockpit problem. Um, the classic example here is Boeing, when they were designing the 777, um, had the opportunity, they had a completely glass cockpit for the first time. And the, the, all the buttons and switches and knobs that made up a standard aircraft cockpit were replaced, airliner cockpit were replaced with glass. And now, there you are, you can do, build any UI you want. And so they did. And after a while, 10 minutes, we started it. Was it, we only had 20 minutes scheduled? 30 minutes scheduled, okay, all right, well we better move on. Um, after a while they found out that the, that they had to go back and their glass cockpit actually looked just like a 747 cockpit after a while pretty close because 
they had a tremendous investment, right, in pilot training, in materials, manuals, blah, blah, blah. Couldn't get away from it. And, you know, one of the interesting questions with Python is how much of that cockpit problem you have. I suspect the people who raised their hand for postfix and prefix increment and decrement were partly suffering from the fact that every time they get behind the wheel of Python, they're like, dang, I keep thinking I can type this and then I can't. It's a real problem. And it's a problem that you don't think about until you start designing programming languages and, you know, trying to evaluate them. Um, and, yeah, the offsides rule is definitely um, worth angry old man and says the offsides rule was, uh, you know, definitely uh, is something we should talk about. Because um, this is one of the, mo the features that everybody notices about Python. Um, there's, I, I don't think it's as controversial today as it was when it was first introduced in Python. Python was one of the first languages to do this idea of having indentation-based blocks. And there's an argument for why you might not want to do that. But I, th I would say that's one of these features of Python that has kind of proven itself over time for a couple reasons. One is that it does make things more pseudocode-like. And the other one is that um, it enforces upon your coworkers a certain discipline. There's a fundamental rule of programming languages, which is the features that you would like in your programming language aren't the, good, the features you should be shooting for. You, the features you should be shooting for are the features you want in the language your coworkers will be forced to use. And uh, in that sense, you know, having them, your coworkers forced to indent code properly, make the code formatted properly for it to actually work, yay, thank you, um, you know, for making them do that. There's a whole rant about tabs here that I'm going to skip because we're not moving fast enough, but ask me about tabs afterwards if you want a long rant. Um, and Python does a good job with tabs. Um, the missing switch statement, the missing case statement, is a really interesting feature of Python that, you know, you don't notice it first, and then when you notice it, you're like, wow, that's a thing. Why did they do that? And, you know, I think it's a good opportunity to look at um, a uh, particular feature and ask, why were these programming language design decisions made? Um, you know, the first thing is that one of the main motivations providing case and switch statements in languages is efficiency. Python pretty clearly wasn't particularly concerned with efficiency. They, don't, they aren't going to compute index jumps anyway, for those of you who are familiar with programming language implementation. So there's no motivation there, really. Um, another, another thing about the case statement is that it allows you to check sometimes whether you have all the cases covered. But most modern languages don't do that, so why should I worry about that one? Um, the Haskell with its pattern-based pattern -based matching, pattern matching based cases does do that, and so it makes it really powerful to have a separate case statement. The nice thing about ELIF is that it provides you a level of generality. I can put arbitrary expressions in the ELIFs, and so I can format things as if they were case statements, you know, in a switch, or I can format them some, you know, or, or I can use something different if I need to, and so that level of generality makes things maybe easier to read, easier to handle than it would be otherwise. Um, one of the questions that almost any programming languages person will ask about a language is what, what set of values are first class in this programming language? What does first class here mean? It means that anything you'd expect to do with, be able to do with any kind of value, you can do with these kinds of values too. Um, functions are a great example because in C, functions are not first class. Their function pointers are first class, but I can't take a function itself and do things like assign it to a uh, an array or, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of things that I can do with other kinds of values I can't do with functions. Um, in Python, there's a pretty good job of making everything first class. Um, exceptions are captured first class as objects. Um, that We do have first class functions in the form of lambdas in Python 3. That's one of the big additions there. Um, the integers are arbitrary precision, so we don't have to worry so much about conversions between different kinds of first class values. One of the things that isn't a first class value, and in fact isn't a value at all in Python, is the character. And that's a really interesting decision, because it's not a decision that very many languages have made. Characters are considered a fundamental data type in most languages. In Python, they're a kind of one character string. Um, and that's the kind of thing that gives you some insight into what people were thinking maybe sometimes in the language design. First class characters? Um, that's a really good question. What did they gain or lose by getting rid of first class characters? Well, the first thing they got rid of, so that 
C, to be fair, really doesn't have first class characters either. Um, and you know, if you're inspired by C, then you, one of the things you notice is that there's all this troubling instances where really characters are just small integers and they're really treated exactly like small integers. Um, that doesn't work out very well in a lot of ways. It, it loses you a bunch of type checking opportunities. It loses you a bunch of opportunities to think about value conversions. There's a bunch of bad things that happen there. So they wanted to get away from that, I'm almost certain. And I can't blame them. Um, Given that you're going to make characters first class, then there's a question of can you make strings first class? And honestly, most languages that have first class characters, strings are a fiction in. Um, so in Haskell or in a lot of languages, really, a string is just an, a sy special syntax for a list of characters. Um, and you don't have any strings except lists of characters. And so um, you, know, you maybe you don't want to have both. Um, and you get a pick. And they pick strings rather than characters because it gives you some type checking opportunities, it gives you some convenience, and it doesn't lose you very much. There isn't very much that goes wrong um, if you do that. You know, it's a weird decision. I, I, you just heard everything I can guess um, as a programming languages designer. You should really ask Guido that one and find out what he says. Um, Confession Bear. Confession Bear is one of my favorite guys. Um, I'm not a big OOP fan. Maybe that's a sacrilege in this room, but it's just where I am. Um, and yet, you know, it's obviously really important. I can't get away from using it. I can't get away from teaching it to students. And so it's worth talking a tiny bit about the Python object system. Given the limits of time, there's only so much we can say about the Python object system. It's a lightweight object system. It has kind of a goofy initializer syntax. It's kind of bog standard. Maybe the most important thing about it is that it's sort of baked into the language in some ways. You can't really program in Python without at least making method calls. Um, and uh, there's a lot of places in which the language is implemented in terms of objects. So objects really are a required part of Python, even though on the surface the syntax doesn't, you know, it doesn't look like that, right? And that's an interesting sort of design decision that other languages have made as well. It, the upside is that it makes some things easier. The downside is it may make the language harder to learn and work with. As somebody teaching Python to new people, it's a real problem because early on I have to teach them how to make method calls so they can do things like find out the length of a string. Uh, well, that's not a good example. Sorry, I don't need to do it for that. But there are a bunch of things where you know, you're manipulating strings and all of a sudden you have to make method calls even though I haven't told them what an object or a method is yet. It's an interesting spot in the decision space. This business of using a single type for both arrays and list is a really cool idea. And uh, it's one of the things that I think is one of the most uniquely positive features of Python. You get most of the performance win of arrays, is the very short version, together with most of the uh, convenience of lists um, it's, and performance wins of lists. It's, it's a really sweet. It's a really sweet spot in the design space. And uh, it's pretty unique to Python, most languages don't do this thing well. Um, there's a lot of languages where you only have lists and you can treat them like arrays, but you get all the performance problems of arrays um, when you do that, of lists, I mean, when you do that. Minor mistake Marvin here. Um, one of the early goals of Python was to get rid of variable declarations, not even let, right? There's not even any announcement that, an that a, you're making a new variable. That leads to a weird situation. Really quickly, who can tell me what does this piece, piece of code do? I guess we'll do it by show of hands. How many people um, think that this code will print five and then set the global variable x to six? How many people think that? Okay, you're all good Python programmers. How many people think that it will print five and then set the local variable x to six? Quite a bunch of you. How many think a third thing? Ah, good. So those are the people who actually know Python. What this code will do is crash at compile time saying, sorry, this isn't going to work for me. And the reason it's going to do that is a really weird reason. It's that when it sees the inner um, assignment of x equals 6, it says, ah, in this scope, x must be a local variable. Then it sees the print and says, that must be printing the local variable, but it doesn't have a value yet crash. Um, it seems like a terrible mistake. That behavior is epically confusing to newcomers. 
But the funny thing about it is it's a corner that the language wrote itself in a long time ago by not having any explicit signifier that something needs to be a variable. How do I get around this? I stick the keyword, I stick the statement global x on the inside of the block. Or I assign a value to x if I want it to be local before the print statement. It's a thing, but it's a great example, and this is why I wanted to point it out, not really to make fun of Python, although I think it is pretty sad, but uh, to say that these things aren't like just dumb decisions. It isn't like somebody woke up one morning and decided to have a terrible behavior. It's that it's hard to get, figure out, and I've thought about it a lot, what behavior you would want to have instead there that didn't involve giving up on this idea of just creating variables as they're needed. So it's an interesting sort of programming languages thing to have happen. There's a namespace-based mod module system in Python. I think that's perfectly reasonable. It's what most programming languages do in 2015. Um, if you've used something like the SML uh, functor-based module system, which you haven't, you realize how much cooler module systems can be. But, um, you know, I don't think this is a problem. And if you're gonna do that, it does an okay job. Probably the worst problem with, problems with the module system is the syntax is a little error prone. People make mistakes all the time trying to figure out how to write stuff down. And more importantly, the export control is really bad. If I make a Python module, all the names tend to escape, and uh, it's really hard to control that. And so you have to do kind of epic things to actually do information hiding, which is kind of too bad. Um, most namespace-based module systems let you control what gets exported. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is that, you know, success kids, success kids is the Python folks have spent decades working on a nice, simple programming language, um, and it's paid off. I think you have a language that's popular, a language that's useful. You know, when I look at Python, I, I use it. You know, it's one of the four or five languages that I use regularly, and I'm really happy about it. But um, a lot went on in the design space behind the scenes to make that work. Um, you know, the thing I want to close with, and I really will leave a few minutes for questions, um, people always ask me, is Python a good language? And I'm like, it's not really a meaningful question, right? I mean. It, I can talk about a language being terrible, but there's no like, you know, there's no like strict hierarchy of programming languages where X is always better than Y. There's a lot of reasons why you might want to use a language in a lot of ways you might want to use it. It's certainly, there isn't too much bad about it. It's certainly suitable for some domains. If I'm teaching, uh, teaching if I'm prototyping, um, you know, if I'm doing implementations where dynamic is a really important thing, um, yeah, I'm really excited about it using Python in those settings. Um, maybe the thing I should close with, and again, maybe this isn't popular at a Python conference, but you know me, I don't care. Um, the thing to remember at the end of the day is that in the process of building software, implementing, writing code, is the least important part anyhow. If you get your requirements in design right, if you've built something sensible, most of your effort doesn't go into actually coding. And part of the reason that I can't get very excited about the language wars, in spite of being a person who's very interested in programming languages, is that at the end of the day, Python's certainly good enough that you can make it not the bottleneck of getting some cool code built. And so in that sense, I think as a programming languages and software person, you know, I definitely give it an A. Um, that's what I have time for, really. Are there any last questions or comments? Yeah. Okay, so there's a scripting language, programming language question, and that is absolutely a valid question. It's a really hard distinction to draw as a programming languages person. Um, you know, what kinds of properties does the scripting language have? Well, they tend to be dynamic, you know, in the sense that they're dynamic runtime, dynamic typed. They tend to have good facilities for invoking things externally. In those senses, Python's a scripting language. They tend to be, um, have simple structure, not very much static scope, not very much heavy machinery. In those kind of senses, Python's not really a scripting language. It looks more like a general purpose programming language. One way in which Python is definitely a scripting language, um, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> look, some of the bad news, if I had to rate Python, you know, if I had to talk about bad points of Python in a Python conference, um, the performance problem's really real here. Um, this is a, these numbers are from a little benchmark I did where I tried to implement a tic-tac-toe game solver in, you know, recursive descent solver in a adversary search solver in 
a bunch of different languages as, as similarly and cleanly as I could. And uh, you, know, you can see that the Python thing is, you know, depending on how you count, 20 or 80 times slower than the, <laughs> than the C code. That starts to be a real problem. The only things worse than the Python are um, the, you know, nickels a little worse. Um, so the difference between those two is the eight seconds one is the implementation you're probably all using. The, the, one, the 1 1.6 second one is, compile, is a compiled Python. I forget which of the many compiled Pythons it is, but it's one of them. And you'd think, well, compiling, that'll make it a lot faster, and it does, but it's still 20 times slower than C. Um, and, you know, one of the consequences of that, you know, one of the things you could say about Python as a critique is, well, you know, it doesn't have much support for parallelism. But when you're already 40 times slower than, you know, fast languages, it doesn't really matter very much whether you get some parallelism because you're not likely to have 40 pro processors around to catch up. You're much better off trying to get some more performance out of that one processor that's sitting on your desk. And so that's part of why I didn't choose to talk about parallelism in here. But in general, the whole scripting programming thing, meh. There's a lot more of a blurry boundary anyway. Um, web apps and stuff like that are pretty blurry about whether they're scripting or programming. Python, the, the comment is that Python's static scope is a little confusing. And yeah, the, I, th I think I gave an example that was designed to illustrate that. I don't think they're unlearnable. You eventually figure them out, but you know, it's, like I say, they kind of trap themselves into a design corner, and I get that. I have a lot of sympathy, but I don't know what to do about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things I didn't talk about real explicitly, just because of time constraints, was static typing, which, I feel like the inability to statically type is a serious weakness of Python, but on the other hand, it's pretty clearly a deliberate design choice of the community, and you understand the reasons why. Um, you know, the belief is that we want our stuff to look like pseudocode. Types make it really hard to read and really confusing in that sense. Um, obviously, one of the other reasons that sometimes people's static type is for performance, and again, obviously, that isn't a concern here, so why? why throw static types in. I personally believe that static types are super important for correctness of code because they're, you know, catching errors at compile time is way better than catching them at runtime and testing is really hard, um, which is why Nickel supports static typing um, as a thing. But in the grand scheme of things, I totally get why they made that decision. And, you know, it's a thing that you just have to understand. Yeah. So that's a great question. The question was, you know, what about programming languages from individuals, you know, um, from, that have a single architect, really, and versus languages that maybe come out of more of a committee effort? I think, you know, part of that, it's a hard question to answer, partly because even the languages that look like they came out of a committee, somebody, one or two or three people, really, you know, sat down and did the first draft. Um, you know, the committee may bang on it. You know, C++ is the epic example here, right? I mean, it's pretty clear that the current version of C++ was written by a large committee of people interacting over a long period of time. That doesn't mean Strewstrip didn't design the original language, but his child was taken over by, um, you know, foster parents a long time ago. Um, the, the, like any kind of software architecture, usually you get better results if one or two or three single, you know, a small number of very talented people with a common vision do the architecture than if it's done by committee. Um, and I think most of the successful languages have that property. Uh, it's really hard for me to think of a lot of counterexamples to that, um, to even talk about. Um, the problem with that is if the person has terrible taste, um, you know, and yet has global influence, true <coughs> strip, sorry, I, I did that, sorry. Um, you know, it can create a real problem, not just, you know, for everybody around in the industry, really. And so, you know, it's a, it's a flawed process. And it's part of the reason why we have so many programming languages around is because if you tried to get a committee to design the one true programming language, as we have several times, Ada was like that, Algol 67 was like that, um, 
you find out it doesn't work very well because nobody can agree on all this stuff. So, so the question was, what about languages for social coding and, you know, at, where a bunch of people are collaborating interactively and what should be like that? I mean, I would argue that almost all coding is social coding in some sense. Um, you know, any more than a one-person project and all of a sudden you have these problems. I agree that Python has as one of its strengths readability and the ease of interchanging code. That's absolutely true. I'm partial to some other languages that have that property. And one of the things that comes up in that context is the important weird bootstrap question, right? I can't pick Agda, even if I think it was the coolest language ever for social coding, because there's only 100 people in the world who can program in it, and uh, it's got a 10-year learning curve, so there aren't going to be any more tomorrow. Um, you know, it's a complicated question. I don't think I have a really super clean answer, but certainly Python is in that family of languages people use successfully for this all the time, and after looking at stuff like this, you start to see why. Uh, I'm told it is stopping time and then some, so I'd be happy to take this into the hallway. I hope it was instructive, and uh, let's chat. Thanks. Thank you.